Greetings everybody. This is Hong Long from Hong Long Wuja. And today's video is going to be slightly different than the previous ones. In today's video, we're going to be hiking up Trail Canyon right outside of Las Vegas. And while we're doing this, we're going to be going over a subject that apparently a lot of people that I know on both the left and right are really unfamiliar with. And that subject is the subject of fascism. As we hike up Trail Canyon here, I plan on reading a number of articles from fascism's greatest enemy, Leon Trotsky. The articles that I'm reading from are uh, taken directly from the Marxist Internet Archives. I will put links in the description below to those articles. As always, if you haven't already, subscribe to the channel, share widely amongst your friends, and like the video. The first article that I plan on reading today uh, was written by Trotsky in November of 1931 while he was in exile in Turkey. It is titled, What is Fascism? Extracts from a Comrade. I am writing you today regarding the question of fascism. It would be well if you were to discuss three questions with the English comrades, since in this manner we can arrive at conclusions and definite views. What is fascism? The name originated in Italy. Were all the forms of counter-revolutionary dictatorship fascist or not? That is, prior to the advent of fascism in Italy. The former dictatorship in Spain of Primo de Rivera is called a fascist dictatorship by the common term. Is this correct or not? We believe that that is incorrect. The fascist movement in Italy was a spontaneous movement of large masses with new leaders from the rank and file. It is a plebeian movement in origin directed and financed by big capitalist powers. It issued <coughs> forth from the petty bourgeoisie, the slum proletariat, and even to a certain extent from the proletarian masses. Mussolini, a former socialist, is a self-made man arising from this movement. Primo de Rivera was an aristocrat. He occupied a high military and bureaucratic post and was chief governor of Catalonia. He accomplished his overthrow with the state and military forces. The dictatorships of Spain and Italy are two totally different forms of dictatorship. It is necessary to distinguish between them. Mussolini had great difficulty in reconciling many old military institutions with the fascist militia. This problem did not exist for Primo de Rivera. The movement in Germany is analogous mostly to the Italian movement. It is a mass movement with its leaders employing a great deal of socialist demagogy. This is necessary for the creation of the mass movement. The genuine basis is the petty bourgeoisie. In Italy, it is a very large base. The petty bourgeoisie of the towns and cities and the peasantry in Germany, likewise, there is a large base for fascism. In England, there is less of that base because the proletariat is the overwhelming majority of the population. The peasant or farming stratum only an insignificant section. It may be said that this is true to a certain extent, that the new middle class, the functionaries of the state, the private administrators, etc., etc., can constitute such a base. But this is a new question that must be analyzed. This is a supposition. It is necessary to analyze just what it will be. It is necessary to foresee the fascist movement growing from this or that element. But this is only a perspective which is controlled by events. I am not affirming that it is impossible for a fascist movement to develop in England or for a Mosley or someone else to become a dictator. This is a question for the future. It is a far-fetched possibility. To speak of it now as an imminent danger is not a prognosis, but a mere prophecy. In order to be capable of foreseeing anything in the direction of fascism, it is necessary to have a definition of that idea. What is fascism? What is its base, its form, and its characteristics? How will its development take place? The aim of this is to show the English comrades that the question is not a simple one. It is necessary to proceed in a scientific and Marxian manner. Now, another question, naturally, it is important that you occupy yourself with the isolated elements of the left opposition, but it is no less important to pay close attention to what is taking place in the Communist Party, the Independent Labor Party, and the Labor Party. The first tremors or the earthquake must have produced very great cracks in the wall of the house, and the Bolshevik Leninists can gain an influence among a large section of labor movement. It is necessary to direct your attention not only to our little section, but to everything that is happening in this great organism. 
This letter is a very rough form. I have not even checked its contents, but I trust that you will get the general sense of the ideas expressed. Leon Trotsky. The next article that I'm going to read was also written in Turkey, and it is also a letter. The title is uh, The Impending Danger of Fascism in Germany, a letter to a German communist worker on the United Front against Hitler, dated December 1931. At the present moment, Germany is going through one of those great historic hours upon which the fate of the German people, the fate of Europe, and in an important measure, the fate of all humanity will depend for decades. If you place a ball on top of a pyramid, the slightest impact can cause it to roll down either to the left or to the right. That is the situation approaching with every hour in Germany today. There are forces who would like the ball to roll down towards the right and break the back of the working class. There are forces who would like the ball to remain at the top. That is a utopia. The ball cannot remain at the top of the pyramid. The communists want the ball to roll down toward the left and to break the back of capitalism. But it is not enough to want. One must know how. Let us calmly reflect once more. Is the policy carried on at present by the Central Committee of the Communist Party of Germany correct or incorrect? What does Hitler want? The fascists are growing very rapidly. The communists are also growing, but much more slowly. The growth at the extreme poles shows that the ball cannot maintain itself at the top of the pyramid. The rapid growth of the fascists signifies the danger that the ball may roll down toward the right. Therein lies an enormous danger. Hitler emphasizes that he is against a coup d'etat. In order to strangle democracy once and for all, he is willing to achieve power no differently, so to speak, than by the democratic road. Can we seriously believe this? Of course, if the fascists could figure on attaining an absolute majority of the vote, votes at the next elections in a peaceful way, then they would perhaps even prefer this road. In reality, however, this road is unthinkable for them. It is stupid to believe that the Nazis would grow uninterruptedly as they do now for an unlimited period of time. Sooner or later, they will drain their social reservoir. Fascism has introduced into its own ranks such dreadful contradictions that the moment must come in which the flow will cease to replace the ebb. The moment can arrive long before the fascists will have united about them even half of the votes. They will not be able to halt, for they will have nothing more to expect here. They will be forced to resort to an overthrow. But even apart from all this, the fascists are cut off from their democratic road. The immense growth of the political antagonisms in the country, the stark brigands agitation of the fascists will inevitably lead to a situation in which the closer the fascists come to get a majority, the more <clears throat> heated the atmosphere will become and the more extensive the unfolding of the conflicts and the struggles will be. From this perspective, civil war is absolutely inevitable. Consequently, the question of the seizure of power by the fascists will not be decided by vote, but by civil war, which the fascists are preparing and provoking. Can we assume even one minute that Hitler and his advisors do not realize and foresee this? That would mean to consider them blockheads. There is no greater crime in politics than that of hoping for stupidities on the part of a strong enemy. If Hitler cannot help being aware that the road to power leads through gruesome civil war, then that means that his speeches regarding the peaceful democratic road are only a cloak, that is, a stratagem. In that case, it is all the more necessary to keep one's eyes open. What is concealed behind Hitler's stratagem? His calculations are altogether simple and obvious. He wants to lull his antagonists with the long-run perspective of the parliamentary growth of the Nazis in order to catch them napping and deal them a death blow at the right moment. It is entirely possible that Hitler's courtesies to democratic parliamentarism may, moreover, help to set up some sort of coalition in the immediate future in which the fascists will obtain the most important posts and employ them in turn for their coup d'etat. For it is entirely clear <clears throat> that the coalition, let us assume, between the center and the fascists will not be a stage in the democratic solution of the question, but a step closer to the coup d'etat under conditions most favorable to the fascists. We must plan according to the shorter perspective. All this means that, that even regardless of the desires of the fascist general staff, the solution can arrive in the course of the next few months, if not weeks. The circumstance is of tremendous importance in elaborating a correct policy. If we allow the fascists to seize power in two or three months, then the struggle against them next year will be much harder than this. 
All revolutionary plans laid out in advance for two, three, or five years will prove to be only wretched and disgraceful twaddle if the working class will allow the fascists to achieve power in the course of the next two, three, or five months. The calculation of time in the polity of revolutionary crises is just as, just as in war operations of decisive importance. Let us take another more remote example for the clarification of our idea. Hugo Arbanz, <laughs> who considers himself a left communist, declares the German party bankrupt, politically done for, and proposes to create a new party. If Urbans was right, what that would mean that the victory of the fascists is certain. For in order to create a new party, years are needed, and at that, and at that, it is not at all proved that the party of Urbans would in any case be better than Thalman's party. When Urbans was at the head of the party, there were in no ways fewer mistakes. Yes. Should the fascists really conquer power, that would mean not only the physical destruction of the Communist Party, but veritable political bankruptcy for it. An ignominious defeat in a struggle against bands of human rubbish, the many millions of German proletariat would never forgive the Communist International and its German section. The seizure of power of the fascists would therefore most probably signify the necessity of creating a new revolutionary party and in all probability also of a new international. <clears throat> that would be a frightful historical catastrophe. But to assume today that all this is unavoidable, only genuine liquidationists are capable of. That is, those who under the mantle of their hollow phraseology are actually capable only of capitulating in a cowardly manner in the face of struggle and without a struggle. With this conception, we Bolshevik Leninists who are called Trotskyites by the Stalins have nothing in common. We are unflinchingly convinced that the victory over the fascists is possible, not after their coming into power, not after 5, 10, or 20 years of their rule, but now, under the given conditions, in the coming months and weeks. Thalman considers the victory of fascism inevitable. A correct policy is necessary in order to achieve victory. That is, we need a policy appropriate to the present situation, to the present relationship of forces, and not to a situation that may develop in one, two, or three years, when the question of power will have been decided for a long time. The whole misfortune lies in the fact that the policy of the Central Committee of the German Communist Party, in a part consciously and in a part unconsciously, derives from the recognition of the inevitability of a fascist victory. In fact, in the appeal for the Red United Front, published on November 29, 1931, the Central Committee of the Communist Party of Germany starts out with the idea that it is impossible to vanquish fascism without first defeating <clears throat> the social democracy. This same idea, Thalman repeats in all possible shades in his article. Is this idea correct? On the historical scale, it is unconditionally correct. But that does not at all mean that what that with its aid, that is, by simple repetition, one can solve the questions of the day. An idea, correct from the point of view of revolutionary strategy as a whole, turns into a lie, and at that, into a reactionary <laughs> lie, if it is not translated into the language of tactics. Is it correct that in order to destroy unemployment and misery, it is first necessary to destroy capitalism? It is correct. But only a hopeless fool can draw the conclusions therefrom that we do not have to fight already today with all of our forces against these measures with the aid of which capitalism is increasing the misery of the workers. Can we expect that the Communist Party will in the course of the next few months defeat both the social democracy and fascism? No. Normally thinking person who, no normally thinking person who can read and calculate would risk such a contention. Politically, the question is posed in the following manner. Can we successfully repel fascism in the course of the next few months? That is, with the existence of a greatly reduced, but still unfortunately very strong social democracy. The Central Committee replies in the negative. In other words, Thalman considers the victory of fascism inevitable. Once again, the Russian experiences. In order to express my thought as clearly and as concretely as possible, I come back once more to the experience with the Cornell of Kornilov uprising on August 26, old style, 1917. General Kornilov led his Cossack troops and one irregular division against Petrograd. At the helm of power, there stood at the time Kerensky, lackey of the bourgeoisie and three quarters an ally of Kornilov. Lenin was still in hiding because of the accusation that he was in the service of the Hohenzollerns. On the same accusation, I was at the time incarcerated in solitary confinement in the Kresti prison. How did the Bolsheviki proceed in this question? They also had a right to say, in order to defeat Korn the Korniloviet, <laughs> the, 
the Kornilovyed, we must first defeat the Kerenskyad. They said this more than once, for it was correct and necessary for the entire further propaganda. But that was entirely insufficient ground not to put up a resistance on August 26th and on the following days against Kornilov and to prevent him from butchering the Petrograd proletariat. The Bolsheviki did not, for that reason, content themselves with a general appeal to the workers and soldiers to break the conciliators and support the Red United Front of the Bolsheviki. No, the Bolsheviki proposed the United Front struggle to the Mensheviks and the social revolutionaries and created together with them common organizations of struggle. Was this correct or incorrect? Let Thelman give me an answer to this question. In order to th show much more boldly how matters stood with the United Front, I will cite the following incident. Immediately upon my release from solitary confinement, confinement, after the trade unions had put up bail for me, I went directly to the Committee for National Defense, where I discussed and voted decisions regarding the struggle against Kornilov with the Menshevik Don and the social revolutionary Gotz, the allies of Kerensky who had imprisoned me. Was this correct or was it wrong? Let Remel answer this question for me. Is Brunick the lesser evil? The social democracy supports Brunick, votes for him, assumes the responsibility for him before the masses on the basis that the Brunick government is the lesser evil. The Rote Fahne attempts to describe the same view to me. On the basis that I express myself against the stupid and shameful participation of the communists in the Hitler referendum. <laughs> But have the German left opposition and myself in particular demanded that the communists vote for and support Brunick? We Marxists regard Brunick and Hitler together with Brown as component parts of one in the same system. The question, which one of them is the lesser evil, has no sense. For the system against which we are fighting needs all these elements. But these elements are momentarily involved in conflicts with one another and the party of the proletariat must take advantage of these conflicts in the interests of the revolution. There are seven keys in the musical scale. The question of which of these keys is better, do, re, or sol, is a senseless question. But the, musician, but the musician must know when to strike and what keys to strike. The abstract question as to who is the lesser evil, Brunick or Hitler, is just as senseless. It is necessary to know which of these keys to strike. Is that clear? For the weak-minded, let us cite another example. When one of my enemies sets before me small daily portions of poison, and the second, on the other hand, is about to shoot straight at me, then I will first knock the revolver out of the hand of my second enemy, for this gives me an opportunity to get rid of my first enemy. But that does not at all mean that the poison is a lesser evil in comparison to the revolver. The misfortune consists precisely of the fact that the leaders of the German Communist Party have placed themselves on the same ground as the social democracy, only with inver inverted prefixes. The social democracy votes for Brunick, recognizing in him the lesser evil. The communists, on the other hand, who refuse to trust either Braun or Brunick in any way, and that is absolutely the correct way of acting, in the meantime, go into the streets to support Hitler's referendum, that is, the attempt of the fascists to overthrow Brunick. But in this, they themselves have recognized in Hitler the lesser evil for the victory of the referendum would not have brought the proletariat into power, but Hitler. To be sure, it is painful to have to argue such ABC questions. It is very sad. It is sad, very sad indeed, when musicians like Ranel, instead of distinguishing between the keys, stamp with their boots on the keyboard. It is not a question of the workers who have already left the social democracy, but of those who still remain with it. The thousands upon thousands of Noskis, Weiss, Hilferdings prefer in the last analysis fascism to communism. But for that, they must once and for all tear themselves loose from the workers. Today, this is not yet the case. Today, the social democracy as a whole, with all the internal antagonisms, is forced into sharp conflicts with the fascists. Our task consists of taking advantage of these conflicts and not of uniting the antagonists against us. The front must be directed against fascism at the present time. And this common front of direct struggle against fascism involving the entire proletariat must be utilized in the flank attacks against the social democracy, which are for all that no less effective. It is necessary, in fact, to show complete readiness to make a block with the social democrats against the fascists in all cases in which they will accept the block. To say to the social democratic workers, throw your leaders aside and join our brown 
party united front means to add just one more hollow phrase to a thousand others. It is necessary to be able to tear the workers away from their leaders in reality. But reality today is the struggle against fascism. There are and doubtless will be social democratic workers who are prepared to fight hand in hand with the communist workers against the fascists, regardless of the desires or even against the desires of their social democratic organizations. With such progressive elements, it is obviously necessary to establish the closest possible contact. At the present time, however, they are not great in number. The German worker has been raised in the spirit of organization and of discipline. This has its strong as well as its weak sides. The overwhelming majority of the social democratic workers will fight against the fascists, but for the, prolet but for the present at least, only together with their organizations. This stage cannot be skipped. We must aid the social democratic workers by deeds. In his new and extraordinary situation, in testing the value of their organizations and leaders at this time, when it is a matter of life and death for the working class. We must force the social democracy into a block against the fascists. The misfortune is that in the Central Committee of the Communist Party, there are many frightened opportunists. They have heard that opportunism consists of a love for blocks, and that is why they are against blocks. They do not understand the difference between, let us say, a parliamentary agreement and an ever so modest agreement for struggle in a strike or in the defense of workers' print shops against fascist bans. Election agreements, parliamentary compromises concluded between the Revolutionary Party and the Social Democracy serve, as a rule, to the advantage of the Social Democracy. Per Practical agreements for mass action for purposes of struggle are always of use to the Revolutionary Party. The Anglo-Russian Committee was an impermissible type of block of two leaderships on one common political platform. Vague, deceptive, binding no one to any sort of action. The maintenance of this block at the time of the general strike when the General Council assumed the role of strike breaker signified on the part of the Stalinists a policy of betrayal. No common platform <clears throat> with the social democracy or with the leaders of the German trade unions. No common publications, banners, placards. March separately, but strike unitedly. Agree only how to strike, whom to strike, and when to strike. Such an agreement can be concluded even with the devil himself, with his grandmother, and even with Nusk, Noski and Krasinski. On one condition, not to bind one own, one's own hands. It is necessary without any delay, finally, to elaborate a practical system of measures, not with the aim of merely exposing the social democracy before the communists, but with the aim of actual struggle against fascism. The question of factory defense organizations, of unhampered activity on the part of the factory council, the inviolability of the workers' organizations and institutions, the question of arsenals that may be seized by the fascists, the question of measures in the case of emergency, that is, of the coordination of the, fact, of the actions of the communist and the social democratic divisions in the struggle, etc., etc., must be dealt with in this program. In the struggle against fascism, the factory councils occupy an enormously important position. Here's a particular precise program of action is necessary. Every factory must become an anti-fascist bulwark with its own commandments, with its own commandants, and its own battalions. It is necessary to have a map of the fascist armories and all other fascist strongholds in every city and in every district. The fascists are attempting to encircle the revolutionary strongholds. The encirclers must be encircled. On this basis, a pact with the social democratic and trade union organization is not only permissible, but a duty. To reject this for reasons of principle, in reality because of bureaucratic stupidity, or what is still worse because of cowardice, is to give direct and immediate aid to fascism. <coughs> Excuse me. A practical program of agreements with the Second Democratic Workers we proposed as far back as September 1930. The turn to in the common turn and the situation in Germany published by the militant. That is a year and a quarter ago. What has the leadership undertaken in this direction? Next to nothing. The Central Committee of the Communist Party has taken up everything except that which forms its direct tax. How much valuable, irrevocable time has been lost. Truly, there is not much time left. The program of action must be strictly practical, strictly objective, to the point without any of those artificial claims, without any afterthoughts, so that every average social democratic worker can say to himself, what the communists propose is completely indispensable in the struggle against fascism. On this basis, 
condition on this basic condition it is possible to pull the social democratic workers along with us by our example and to criticize their leaders who will inevitably ter serve as a check and a break only in this way is victory possible a good quotation from lenin the present day epigenes that is the thoroughly bad disciples of lenin like to fill up their gaps on every occasion that offers itself with often entirely irrelevant quotations for the marxists the question is not decided by quotation, but by means of a correct method. If one is guided by correct methods, it is not hard to also find the fitting quotations. After I had drawn the above analogy with the Cornelia of insurrection, I said to myself, we can probably find a theoretical explanation for our block with the conciliators in the struggle against Kornilov in Lenin. And actually, here is what I found in the second part of volume 14 of the Russian edition in a letter of Lenin to the Central Committee written at the beginning of September 1917. Even at, in quotes, he writes, even at the present, it is not our duty to support the Kerensky government. That would be unprincipled. Someone asked, then we are not to fight against Kornilov? Naturally we are, but that is not one and the same thing. There is a limit to this. It is being transgressed by many Bolsheviks who fall into conciliationism and allow themselves to be driven by the current of events. We shall fight. We do fight against Kornilov, but we do not support Kerensky. We are uncovering his weaknesses. The distinction is very delicate, but highly important and must not be forgotten. Wherein does the change of our tactics after the Kornilov insurrection consist? In this, that the forms of struggle against Kerensky vary. Without diminishing our hostility against him, even by one note, without taking back one word from what we have said against him, without rejecting the task of overthrowing Kerensky, we say, we must calculate the moment. We will not overthrow Kerensky at present. We approach the question of the struggle against him differently, and namely, by explaining the weaknesses and vacillations of Kerensky before the people who are fighting against Kornilov. End of quotes. We are proposing nothing different from this. Complete independence of the communist organization and press. Complete freedom of the communist criticism. The same for the social democracy and trade units. To allow the freedom of the communist party to be limited, for example, in the manner of entrance into the Kuomintang, only despicable opportunists are capable of. Our place is not among them. There is nothing to take back from our criticism of the social democracy, nothing to forget of all that has been. The entire historical account, including the account for Karl Liebknecht and Rosa Luxemburg, will be president. <laughs> the entire historical account, including the account for Karl Liebknecht and Rosa Luxemburg, will be presented in time as we Russian Bolsheviks also presented it finally to the Mensheviks and social revolutionaries as a general accounting for the baiting, slander, imprisonment, and murder carried on against workers, soldiers, and peasants. But we presented our general account to them months after we had utilized the partial accounting between Kerensky and Kornilov, between the Democrats and the fascists. And at that, in order to repel the fascists with all the more certainty, only thanks to this circumstance were we able to be victorious. When the Central Committee of the Communist Party of Germany adopts the position expressed in the lines of Lenin quoted above, the entire approach to the social democratic masses and the trade union organizations will change with one blow. Instead of the articles and speeches which are convincing only to those people who are already convinced without them, the agitators will find common language with new hundreds of thousands and millions of workers. The differentiation within the social democracy will proceed in rapid tempo. The fascists will soon begin to feel that their tasks consist not only of defeating Breunig, Braun, and Wells, but in taking up the open struggle against the entire working class. On this plane, a deep differentiation will inevitably begin within fascism. Only by this road is victory possible. But it is necessary to desire this victory. In the meantime, there are among the communist functionaries many cowardly careerists and bureaucrats who hold on to their little posts, to their income and more than that, in their skins very dearly. These creatures are inclined to sprout ultra-radical phrases underneath, which is concealed a wretched and despicable fatalism. Without a victory over the social democracy, it is impossible to strike against fascism, say such terrible revolutionaries. And for this reason, they are getting ready their passports. Worker communists, you are hundreds of thousands, millions. You cannot leave for anywhere. 
There are not enough passports for you. Should fascism achieve power, it will ride over your skulls and spines like a frightful tank. Your salvation lies in merciless struggle, and only in unity and struggle with the social democratic workers can bring victory. Make haste, worker communist. You have very little time left. Leon Trotsky. The next article that I'll be reading is, was also written in Turkey. It is entitled, What is National Socialism? Written in June 1933. Naive minds think that the office of kingship lodges in the king himself, in his ermine cloak and his crown, in his flesh and bones. As a matter of fact, the office of kingship is an interrelation between people. The king is king only because the interests and prejudices of millions of people are refracted through his person. When the flood of development sweeps away these interrelations, then the king appears to be only a washed out man with a flabby lower lip. He who was once called Alfonso VIII could discourse upon this from fresh impressions. The leader by will of the people differs from the leader by will of God in that the former is compelled to clear the road for himself or at any rate to assist the conjuncture of events in discovering him. Nevertheless, the leader is always a relation between people, the individual supply to meet the collective demand. The controversy over Hitler's personality becomes the sharper, the more the secret of his success is sought in himself. In the meantime, another political figure would be difficult to find that is in the same measure the focus of anonymous historic forces. Not every exasperated petty bourgeois could have become Hitler, but a particle of Hitler is lodged in every exasperated petty bourgeois. The rapid growth <coughs> excuse me, the rapid growth of German capitalism prior to the First World War by no means signified a simple destruction of the middle classes. Although it ruined some layers of the petty bourgeoisie, it created many other, it created others anew. Around the factories, artisans and sharpkeepers, within factories, technicians and executives, but while preserving themselves and even growing numerically, the old and the new petty bourgeoisie compose a little less than one half of the German nation. The middle classes have lost <coughs> the middle classes have lost the last shadow of independence. They live on the periphery of large scale industry and the banking system, and they live off the scrums from the table of monopolies and cartels and off the spiritual alms of their theorists and professional politicians. The defeat in 1918 raised the wall in the path of German imperialism. External dynamics changed to internal. The war passed over into revolution. Social democracy, which aided the Hohenzollerns in bringing the war to its tragic conclusion, did not permit the proletariat to bring the revolution to its conclusion. The Weimar democracy spent 14 years finding interminable excuses for its own existence. The Communist Party called the workers to a new revolution, but proved incapable of leading it. The German proletariat passed through the rise and collapse of war, revolution, parliamentarism, and pseudo-Bolshevism. At the time when the old parties of the bourgeoisie had drained themselves to the dregs, the dynamic power of the working class also found itself sapped. The post-war chaos hit the artisans, the peddlers, and the civil employees no less cruelly than the workers. The economic crisis in agriculture was ruining the peasantry. The decay of the middle strata did not mean that they were made into proletarians, inasmuch as the proletariat itself was casting out a gigantic army of chronically unemployed. The pauperization of the petty bourgeoisie, barely covered by ties and socks of artificial silk, eroded all official creeds and, first of all, the doctrine of democratic parliamentarism. The multiplicity of parties, the icy fever of elections, the interminable changes of ministries aggravated the social crisis by creating a kaleidoscope of barren political combinations. In the atmosphere brought to white heat by war, defeat, reparations, inflation, occupation of the Ruhr, crisis, need and despair, the petty bourgeoisie rose up against all the old parties that had, been that had bamboozled, i.e. the sharp grievances of small proprietors never out of bankruptcy, of their university sons without posts and clients, of their daughters without dowries and suitors, demanded an order and an iron hand. 
The banner of National Socialism was raised by upstarts from the lower and middle commanding ranks of the old army. Decorated with medals for distinguished service, commissioned and non-commissioned officers could not believe that their heroism and suffering for the fatherland had not only come to naught, but also gave them no special claims to gratitude. Hence their hatred of the revolution and the proletariat. At the same time, they did not want to reconcile themselves to being sent by the bankers, industrialists, and ministers back to the modest posts of bookkeepers, engineers, postal clerks, and school teachers. Hence their socialism. At the Easter and Verdun, they had learned to risk themselves and others and to speak the language of command, which powerfully <coughs> overawed the petty bourgeois behind the lines. Thus, these people became leaders. At the start of his political career, Hitler stood out only because of his big temperament, a voice much louder than others, and an intellectual mediocrity much more self-assured. He did not bring into the movement any ready-made program. If one disregards the insulted soldier's thirst for vengeance, Hitler began with grievances and complaints about the Versailles terms, the high cost of living, the lack of respect for a meritorious non-commissioned officer, and the plots of bankers and journalists of the Mosaic pro persuasion. There were in the country plenty of ruined and drowning people with scars and fresh bruises. They all wanted to thump with their fists on the table. This Hitler could do better than others. True, he knew not how to cure the evil, but his harangues resounded, now like commands and now like prayers addressed to inexorable fate, doomed classes like those fatally ill, never tire of making variations on their pliance, nor of listening to consolations. Hitler's speeches were all attuned to this pitch. Sentimental formlessness, absence of disciplined thought, ignorance along with gouty erudition, all these minuses turned into pluses. They supplied him with the possibility of uniting all types of dissatisfaction in the beggar's bowl of national socialism and of leading the mass in the direction in which it pushed him. In the mind of the agitator was preserved <clears throat> from among his early improvisations whatever had met with approbation. His political thoughts were the fruits of oratorical acoustics. That is how the selection of slogans went on. That is how the program was consolidated. That is how the leader took shape out of the raw material. Mussolini, from the very beginning, reacted more consciously to social materials than Hitler, to whom the police mysticism of a Metternich is much closer than the political algebra of Machiavelli. Mussolini is mentally bolder and more cynical. It may be said that the Roman atheist only utilizes religion as he does the police and the courts, while his Berlin colleague really believes in the infallibility of the Church of Rome. During the time when the future Italian dictator considered Marx as our common immortal teacher, he defended not unskillfully the theory which sees in the life of contemporary society, first of all, the reciprocal action of two classes, the bourgeoisie and the proletariat. True, Mussolini wrote in 1914, there lie between them very numerous intermediate layers which seemingly form a joining web of human collective. But during periods of crisis, the intermediate classes gravitate, depending upon their interests and ideas, to one or the other of the basic classes. A very important general a, a very important generalization just as scientific medicine equips one with the possibility not only of curing the sick but of sending the healthy to meet their forefathers by the shortest route so the scientific analysis of class relations predestined by its creator for the mobilization of the proletariat enabled Mussolini after he had jumped into the opposing camp to mobilize the middle classes against the proletariat Hitler accomplished the same feat in translating the methodology of fascism into the language of German mysticism. The bonfires which burn the impious literature of Marxism light up brilliantly the class nature of National Socialism. While the Nazis acted as a party and not as a state power, they did not quite find an approach to the working class. On the other side, the big bourgeoisie, even those who supported Hitler with money, did not consider his party theirs. The national renaissance leaned up wholly upon the middle classes, the most backward part of the nation, the heavy ballast of history. Political art consisted in fusing the petty bourgeoisie into oneness through its common hostility to the proletariat. What must be done in order to improve things? 
First of all, throttle those who are underneath. Impotent before big capital, the petty bourgeoisie hopes in the future to regain the social dignity through the ruin of the workers. The Nazis call their overturn by the usurped title of revolution. As a matter of fact, in Germany, as well as in Italy, fascism leaves the social system untouched. Taken by itself, Hitler's overturn has no right even to the name counter-revolution. But it cannot be viewed as an isolated event. It is the conclusion of a cycle of shocks, which began in Germany in 1918. The November Revolution, which gave the power to the workers and peasant Soviets, was proletarian in its fundamental tendencies. But the party that stood at the head of the proletariat returned the power to the bourgeoisie. In this sense, the social democracy opened the era of counter-revolution before the revolution could bring its work to completion. However, so long as the bourgeoisie depended upon the social democracy and consequently upon the workers, the regime retained elements of compromise. All the same, the international and the internal situation of German capitalism left no more room for concessions. As social democracy saved the bourgeoisie from the proletarian revolution, fashion Fascism came in its turn to liberate the bourgeoisie from the social democracy. Hitler's coup is only the final link in the chain of counter-revolutionary shifts. The petty bourgeois is hostile to the idea of development, for development goes immutably against him. Progress has brought him nothing except irredeemable debts. National socialism rejects not only Marxism, but Darwinism. The Nazis curse materialism because the victories of technology over nature have signified the triumph of large capital over small. The leaders of the movement are liquidating intellectualism because they themselves possess second and third rate intellects, and above all, because their historic role does not permit them to pursue a single thought to its conclusion. The petty bourgeois needs a higher authority which stands above matter and above history, and which is safeguarded from competition, inflation, and crisis, and that auction block. To evolution, materialist thought, and rationalism of the 20th, 19th, and 18th centuries is counterposed in his mind national idealism as the source of heroic inspiration. Hitler's nation is the mythological shadow of the petty bourgeoisie itself, a pathetic delirium of a thousand-year Reich. In order to raise it above history, the nation is given the support of the race. History is viewed as the emanation of the race. The qualities of the race are constru construed without relation to changing social conditions. Rejecting economic thought as base, national socialism descends a stage lower. From economic materialism, it appeals to zoologic materialism. The theory of race especially created, it seems, for some pretentious and self-educated individual seeking a universal key to all the secrets of life appears particular melan particularly melancholy in the light of the history of ideas. In order to create the religion of pure German blood, Hitler was obliged to borrow at second hand the ideas of racism from a Frenchman, Count Gobineau a diplomat and a literary, literary dilettante. Hitler found the political methodolog methodology ready-made in Italy, where Mussolini had borrowed largely from the Marxist theory of the class struggle. Marxism itself is the fruit of union among German philosophy, French history, and British economics. To investigate retrospectively the genealogy of ideas, <laughs> even those most reactionary and muddle-headed, is to leave not a trace of racism standing. The immense poverty of National Socialist philosophy did not, of course, hinder the academic sciences from entering Hitler's wake with all sails unfurled once his victory was sufficiently plain. For the majority of the professional rabble, the years of the Weimar regime were periods of riot and alarm. Historians, economists, economists jurists, and philosophers were lost in guesswork as to which of the contending criteria of truth was right. That is, which of the camps would turn out in the end the master of the situation. The fascist dictatorship eliminates the doubts of the Fausts and the vacillations of the hamlets of the university rostrums. Coming out of the twilight of parliamentary relativity, knowledge once again enters into the kingdom of absolutes. Einstein has been obliged to pitch his tent outside the boundaries of Germany. On the plane of politics, racism is a vapid and bombastic variety of chauvinism in alliance with phrenology. As the ruined nobility sought solace in the gentility of its blood, so the pauperized petty bourgeoisie befuddles itself with fairy tales concerning the special superiorities, the special superiorities of its race. 
Worthy of attention is the fact that the leaders of National Socialism are not native Germans, but interlopers from Austria, like Hitler himself, from the former Baltic provinces of the Tsar's empire, like Rosenberg, and from colonial countries, like Hess, who was Hitler's present alternate for the party leadership. A barbarous din of nationalisms on the frontiers of civilizations was required in order to instill into its leaders those ideas which later found response in the hearts of the most barbarous classes in Germany. Personality and class, liberalism and Marxism are evil. The nation is good, but at the threshold of private property, this philosophy is turned inside out. Salvation lies only in personal private property. The idea of national property is the spawn of Bolshevism. Deifying the nation, the petty bourgeois does not want to give it anything. On the contrary, he expects the nation to endow him with property and to safeguard him from the worker and the process server. Unfortunately, the Third Reich will bestow nothing upon the petty bourgeois except new taxes. In the sphere of modern economy, international in its ties and anonymous in its methods, the principle of race seems unearthed from a medieval graveyard. The Nazis set out with concessions beforehand. The purity of race, which must be certified in the kingdom of the spirit by a passport, must be demonstrated in the sphere of economy chiefly by efficiency. Under contemporary conditions, this means competitive capacity. Through the back door, racism returns to economic liberalism, freed from political liberties. Nationalism in economy <laughs> comes down in practice to impotent, though savage, outbursts of anti-Semitism. The Nazis abstract the usurious or banking capital from the modern economic system because it is the spirit of evil. And as is well known, it is precisely in this sphere that the Jewish bourgeoisie occupies an important position. Bowing down before capitalism as a whole, the petty bourgeois declares war against the evil spirit of gain in the guise of the Polish Jew in a long-skirted kaftan and usually without a cent in his pocket. The program becomes the supreme evidence of racial superiority. The program with which National Socialism came to power reminds one very much, alas, of a Jewish department store in an obscure province. What won't you find there? Cheap in price and in quality still lower. Recollections of the happy days of free competition and hazy evocations of the stability of class society. Hopes for the regeneration of the colonial empire and dreams of a shut-in economy. Phrases about a return from Roman law back to the Germanic and pleas for an American moratorium and enorm or an envious hostility to inequality in the person of a proprietor in an automobile and an animal fear of equality in the person of a worker in a cap and without a collar. The frenzy of nationalism and the fear of world creditors. All the refuse of international political thought has gone to fill up the spiritual treasury of the new Germanic messianism. Fascism has opened up the depths of society for politics. Today, not only in peasant homes, but also in city skyscraper, there lives alongside of the 20th century, the 10th or the 13th. A hundred million people use electricity and still believe in the magic power of signs and exorcisms. The Pope of Rome broadcasts over the radio about the miraculous transformation of water into wine. Movie stars go to mediums, aviators who pilot miraculous mechanisms created by man's genius wear amulets on their sweaters. What inexhaustible reserves they possess of darkness, ignorance, and savagery. Despair has raised them to their feet. Fascism has given them a banner. Everything that should have been eliminated from the national organism, organism in the form of cultural excrement in the course of the normal development of society has now come gushing out from the throat. Capitalist society is puking up the undigested barbarism. Such is the physiology of national socialism. German fascism, like Italian fascism, raised itself to power on the backs of the petty bourgeoisie which it turned into a battering ram against the organization of the working class and the institutions of democracy. But fascism in power is least of all the rule of the petty bourgeoisie. On the contrary, it is the most ruthless dictatorship of monopoly capital. Mussolini is right. The middle classes are incapable of independent policies. During periods of great crisis, they are called upon to reduce to absurdity the policies of one of the, uh, one of the two basic classes. Fascism succeeded in putting them at the service of capital. Such slogans as state control of trusts and the elimination of unearned income were thrown, in, 
were thrown overboard immediately upon the assumption of power. Instead, the particularism of German lands leaning upon the peculiarities of the petty bourgeoisie gave way to the capitalist police centralism. Every success of the internal and foreign policies of National Socialism will inevitably mean the further crushing of small capital by large. The program of petty bourgeois illusions is not discarded. It is simply torn away from reality and dissolved in ritualistic acts. The unification of all classes reduces itself to semi-symbolic compulsory labor and to the confiscation of labor holiday of May Day for the benefit of the people. The preservation of the Gothic script as opposed to the Latin is a symbolic revenge for the yoke of the world market. That dependence upon the international bankers, Jews among their number, is not eased in iota. Wherefore, it is forbidden to slaughter animals according to the Talmudic ritual. If the road is to heaven is paved with good intentions, then the avenues of the Third Reich are paved with symbols. Reducing the program of petty bourgeois illusions to a naked bureaucratic masquerade. National socialism raises itself over the nation as the worst form of imperialism. Absolutely vain are hopes that Hitler's government will fail today or tomorrow, a victim of its internal inconsistency. The Nazis required the program in order to assume power, but power serves Hitler not at all for the purpose of fuming the program. His tasks are assigned him by monopoly capital. The compulsory concentration of all forces and resources of the people in the interests of imperialism. The true historic mission of the fascist dictatorship means preparations for war, and this task, in its turn, brooks no internal resistance and leads to a further mechanical concentration of power. Fascism cannot be reformed or retired from service. It can only be overthrown. The political orbit of the regime leans upon the alternative, war or revolution. Trotsky did include a short postscript to this article, which I will not have time to read. Uh, there will, however, be links to the articles I've read in the descriptions below. If you have any questions, write them down below. Or you, if you know me personally, send them to me via Facebook or email. I hope everyone got something from this video educationally, or at least you enjoyed the, the view. If you have any criticisms or comments, also post those below. Uh, I'm just feeling my way out here. I'm learning my... Uh, learning the video making craft and trying to come up with interesting things to tell people about. And I think this is, fascism is a subject that uh, should be on everybody's minds right now. We should all be wondering how to combat this. So until the next time, uh, like, share, and subscribe if you haven't already. And keep practicing. Although in today's, uh, in today's case, keep reading.